Hey, this is René, and in this video I want to show you how to write a trailing stop program in MetaCredit 5. So this will be a um, raw skeleton pretty much for any trailing stop expert advisor that you um, yeah, can imagine and want to program in MetaTrader 5 because the general structure can be always the same. So a trailing stop is pretty much just a system or a um, algorithm that takes the stop loss of your trades and trails it or drags it pretty much into the trade direction if the um, if the price moves into the right direction. So for example, here we have a downtrend and a good trading stop would take the stop loss and trail it um, in a specific distance um, to the current price. So you won't get stopped out on small um, uh, retracements here, but um, yeah, you will be stopped out if the market um, turns completely and goes into the other direction. So whenever we want to write a MetaTrader 5 program, we have to use, or we can use the MetaQuotes language editor. You can find it if you click on IDE or if you click on tools, MetaQuotes uh, language editor. This will open the editor that you can use to write automated trading programs or programs like a trading stop. Then in the, uh, on the left side, you will find the navigator. If you do not find it, click on view navigator. You can highlight experts because in this case we want to um, write an expert advisor and click on new in the upper left corner. Then um, yeah, you can just select expert advisor template as it is already selected um, and you can provide a name after clicking on next here. So we can say trailing stop um, system whatever, doesn't really matter how you name it here and then we have um, some more uh, uh, forms, uh, form fields here that we can fill, but we do not have to. So we click on next, next, and finish. And this will create a um, raw skeleton for an expert advisor, which just covers the three basic functions here. I will uh, delete everything else because we do not need it. These gray lines are just comments. So what we have left is the on init, the on d init, and the on tick function. Uh, these three functions are system functions and they are called by the MetaTrader if we attach this expert advisor to a chart. So for example, the onInit function is called whenever the program is initialized. The onDinit is if it is deinitialized. For example, the onInit would be called if we attach the expert advisor to a chart and the onDinit will be called if we remove it from a chart. And the onTick function is the most important because this is the one that is called with every single tick. Um, you can um, uh, try it out by just writing this print and then in parentheses a text and end the line with a semicolon inside of the uh, curly brackets of this on tick function. And if you then click on compile afterwards, it will take your MQ5 file that you can see here and that you just edited and transform it into a EX5 file. The EX5 file will then automatically appear in the navigator in your MetaTrader 5. Here you should find in the navigator under expert advisors, you should find um, a trading stop system now or whatever your name for your program is. So I could open any chart and um, attach the program to this uh, chart window. So, um, plan chart. So I can just choose trading stop system, drag it into any chart and I click on OK and it appears in the upper right corner and it is now active. If this would be a, um, a weekday, <laughs> right now it is Sunday, so we do not see any ticks, but if it would be a weekday, there we would see um, the print statement in the journal. But what I can do here is I can open the strategy tester. Um, if I click on view uh, strategy tester and let me close the normal terminal here because it doesn't really make sense in um, on weekdays and I click on visualize and there I can also select the expert that I want to test, for example, trading subsystem. And if I now click on start, this will um, uh, visualize the tester for a chosen period um, of historical data. And there in the journal, I will now see the um, uh, text output uh, with every single tick. And um, 
yeah, you can see whenever there is a tick, the on tick function is automatically called and processed. So whatever is written in the on tick function will be executed with every single tick. And this is why um, in 99% of all cases, you want to put your code uh, that manages your trailing stop inside of this on tick function. And what we want to do here is um, a trailing stop has to modify the open positions. Positions in MetaTrader 5 are the kind of trades that are already executed and that are currently in the market. So you see a profit and loss for them. So you, you want to loop all the positions and you can do this by um, um, using a loop like I will now do here. So let me just write the first line and then I will explain it real quick. So um, um, print I. So this is a for loop. A loop is a uh, control structure that you can use if you have a piece of code that has to be executed several times. In this case, we want to execute the code that manages the trailing stop for every single position. So first of all, we have to make clear that we have the right amount of positions because, yeah, as I said, we want to loop uh, or we want to use this loop for every single position. So um, a for loop is always structured like this. First, you have this keyword pretty much, which is for. Then in um, then you open the, the, the brackets here, the round brackets, and then we define a variable. This can be, for example, or this is in most cases, the variable i, which is a integer variable and which has a starting value. Um, if you see this variable i in for loops, this is not because it has to be named i. You could choose any other name. You can say fox or dog or whatever you want to call it. But this is just a programming convention. And yeah, most programmers in any programming language st start with the letter i if they um, initialize a for loop. So this is just a good habit. And a integer variable means that this i variable can hold any number pretty much that doesn't have a decimal point. So um, numbers like this um, can be stored inside of this i variable because they are um, values without a decimal point. And we then initialize the value um, or the variable i with a starting value. So for my example here, this will be zero now. And then as a second um, information for the for loop, we have to declare a condition. So we can say i is smaller than two, for example. And this is the condition that is checked before every run of the loop, pretty much. And then we have a um, another piece of code that is executed after every position, uh, every uh, loop of this for loop. So this could be a concept or a skeleton for a for loop. And what this would do is um, the PC, if it reaches line 13 pretty much, it will first of all go into this precondition here and it would create this variable i inside of your memory of the PC. And it would store the value 0 inside of it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the first step the PC does as soon as line 13 is reached. And afterwards, it would automatically check this condition. So it would check if there is a variable named i in the memory, which is true, of course, and it has the value 0. So the PC checks if 0 is smaller than 2, which is indeed true. So afterwards, after checking this condition, we would go inside of the body of this for loop. And the body is always uh, um, uh, inside of these curly brackets here. And then everything in the body is executed directly after checking the condition. So if we, for example, write print and in the parentheses i and end the line with a semicolon, we would print, um, we would print zero on the first um, run of the loop. And after processing everything that is inside of this body, the PC would not go on with line 18, but it would go on with um, this 
piece of code which is executed every time we processed the body of the loop. So in this case, this is just a way of saying that i has to be incremented and uh, increased by one. So we would add one to our i variable. So right now, um, inside of this i variable, um, one is a number is stored. And after um, yeah, increasing the value i, we would again check the condition. So in this case, we check if one is smaller than two. This is true, so we enter the body. So we print one in this case, because now uh, i is equal to one. And after processing the body, again, we would increase the value of i by one. So in this case, the value will be two. Afterwards, we check the condition again. Two is not smaller than two. So we would not do anything else and we would go on with the following code. So this for loop would have the following output, zero and one. And I can, of course, demonstrate this to you. If I, for example, take this piece of code, put it in the onInit function and click on compile. And if we now activate this program, um, you will see that this is indeed working. So again, I have to open the um, uh, terminal for this and click in the, ex or the toolbox and click in the experts journal down here to see all the outputs of my program. And if I now activate the um, uh, trading stop system, you will see the output is zero and one as I explained before. So this is how you can use a for loop. And the structure is pretty much always the same. And this is why I explained this so slow and so detailed. Because a for loop always has this precondition, then a main condition, which is checked uh, before every run of the um, body of the loop, and then a piece of code that is executed after every um, execution of the body of a loop. And once the condition is no, no longer true, the loop will be... Um, left and um, yeah, the next piece of code after the loop will be executed. So this was just an uh, a, a example. But in this case, we want to loop all the open positions. So this is why I built the for loop like this. The general structure is completely the same. So we have this keyword for, then we initialize a variable i, but in this case, we do not choose zero, uh, value zero, but we choose the value or the return value of the position's total function and subtract one from this value. So position total, or positions total, as you can read in the documentation, which you can find if you click on uh, help MQL5 reference, and then um, you can just type in um, the function name that you want to search for. You will see this returns the number of open positions. And this is a system function, so we can just use it like it is. So if there are three open positions, positions total would return three. If there are five open positions, it would return five. So this is great because we always receive the amount of currently open positions. Then we subtract one from this value. So for, in, for example, if we have three open positions, we would initialize the i variable with two because we have three open positions, we subtract one, so um, what is left is two. And then we check if this value inside of the i variable is greater or equal to zero. Why we do this, I will explain it in a second. And then we go into the body. We can print this. Yeah, we will do something else, um, of course, later. And afterwards, we will not increase i by one, but we want to subtract one from i. So we loop. Um, for example, if we have three open positions, we would initialize i with a value of two. Then we would see two is greater or equal to zero. So we would process the body. Then we would subtract one from two. So one is now stored inside of i. We would check the condition. It is true. We would process the body. We would subtract one from i. Now i is zero, which is still greater or equal to zero. So we would process the body again. Then we subtract one again. Now i is minus one, which is not greater or equal to zero. And we leave the loop. So. If we just um, open some positions now, just for testing purposes, um, because I have um, I make this video on a Sunday, so I cannot open positions in the um, normal market here, or maybe I can do it. Can I do it for Bitcoin? I think I can do it for Bitcoin because Bitcoin should be, um, I should be able to trade Bitcoin. Yes, this works. So 
Um, just opened some positions here. Now I have three open Bitcoin positions and I can now activate my trend line trader on this, uh, no, my trading stop system on this chart. And as you can see now, uh, if there is a new tick, we will see um, the output uh, 2, 1 and 0 here in the experts journal, I think. So we see 2, 1, 0, as you can see here with every tick. And this is because we have three open positions. So this is exactly what I demonstrated before. Positions total will be uh, three in this case. We subtract one, we print everything and everything works fine. So now the question in your mind is, why do we do this? We do this because of course we do not want to print I, but we want to have the ticket numbers of these open positions. So we can use the position get ticket uh, function and we have to provide a index. So as you can see in the documentation, the function returns the ticket of a position with, with a specified index. And this is um, of course a system function, so we do not have to write it on our own, we can just use it, use it straight ahead. So you use this position get ticket function, we provide a index which is i, because i will be two for the first one, one for the second run and zero for the third run. And then we store the return value of this position get ticket function because the return value is of type unsigned long inside a unsigned long variable, which is named position ticket. So what we can do here is we can say, for example, we want to print the result and we can do it like this. Just copy everything as I as I write it. Um, and now we can see, if we look in the experts journal again, we will see that at um, position with uh, or position with index two is um, has this position ID with seven six five in the end. And we can see uh, seven six five in the end. It is this um, position ticket ID which is now at um, position two. And the same is for position one and zero. So um, there is a indexing of open position uh, positions and it always starts with position index zero, which is the very first position. The second position here is index one, the third is index two, the fourth will be index three, the fifth will be index four. And you can see this is just a indexing which always starts at zero and then goes on. And if I, for example, delete the position uh, at position index zero, like this, this would automatically rearrange. So right now, this currently highlighted position is at index zero and this is at index one. So if I just clear this, you will see we only get position zero and one now in the experts journal because position at index two is no longer available with only two open positions. So this is a great way, and I can re um, delete this print statement I think now, this is a great way of looping all the open positions using just the position index and the position get ticket function. And since we now have a position ticket, we can use the position select function like this, select by ticket function, and we have to provide the position ticket here, and we can now select a position. So we can click on compile. And uh, what we did here is we used the position select by ticket function. This is a function which returns bool, so either true or false, because a boolean value can only be true or false. Only these two states can be stored inside of a boolean value. And then as a, um, uh, function parameter here, we have to provide a position ticket of type unsigned long and this is great because obviously we have a position ticket stored inside of our position ticket variable here. So we can just um, provide it as a parameter for the position select by ticket function here. This if is just a if else or if statement or if uh, control structure, however you want to call it. Um, and it, yeah, you can read it in the documentation pretty much, but I will explain it real, real quick. You have this code word if, and then in parentheses here, you have a condition. And the condition can be either true or false. And this is great because our position select by ticket uh, function, it returns a Boolean value, which can be either true or false. So obviously, if this function call succeeds 
we will have true as a result, a result value. So the whole condition for this if statement is true and we would enter the body of this if statement, which is again in curly brackets. So if we were able to open a position, we um, uh, select a position, we, uh, it would be a great idea to check if this is a position of the same symbol than the chart symbol, because this would help us to not yeah, just process this trading stop for any position in the account. So we can say position get string, which is a function that will return a string value, um, uh, which is pretty much, wait, why doesn't it open the documentation? Whoops. Okay. Uh, I think I don't know what happened here. Now I have the documentation in the upper left corner here, which I do not want. So, um, yeah, no, this is not cool. Okay, so, um, yeah, let me open the, um, ah, oh, there it is, the documentation. So, uh, position get string is a um, function which can give us um, information about any, uh, it can give us string information from a currently selected position. And it is important, before you use the position get string function, and there is also a position get integer and a position get double function. Before you use any of these functions, you have to select a position successfully because otherwise this will not work correctly. So always make sure that you use the position select by ticket function before you try to get any string, uh, integer or double information from a position. But um, the position get string function is really easy. It returns a string value, of course, and then it um, wants to know a, um, a identifier. So for example, in um, the brackets here, I can say I want to have the position symbol of this currently selected position. For example, for any position here, it would return BTC USD because this is the position symbol. And I want to check then if this is the same as the current chart symbol, which we can always um, receive using the underscore symbol system variable or predefined variable because this will always return the name of the current chart. So for example, if I add my print statement here, I can say uh, for i we have position ticket blah 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 and we can for example also say uh, position get string position symbol because we want to print the position symbol and again we can also add the underscore symbol variable here. So you can see everything on the, uh, on, in, the, in the journal here. So you can see we still have these two positions with index zero and index one. We still have the position IDs and we have Bitcoin US dollar as a position symbol and as a chart symbol. For example, if I would, um, yeah, no, this is um, enough for now. So. Now we have all these informations, so we know if we reach the body of this inner if statement here, we have selected a position, we know the position ticket, and we know that the position has the same symbol as the chart symbol. So now we can start calculating a stop loss. But before we do this, we um, it would be a good idea to check if it is a buy or a sell position. So we can say position get integer, because this is now a integer value and we can say position type. We can check if it is position type buy like this. Because in this case, it is a buy position and we can do the same thing. Position type buy uh, for, for, for sell positions. And as you saw here, I combined these two if statements here using this else if um, uh, formula pretty much. So the PC first of all checks this if statement or this condition in detail and if it is true we enter the body of this first if statement but it is, if it is false then we check the check um, the second if statement here and check if this condition is true and if it is true we uh, enter the second body of the second if statement here. So here we can now calculate our new SL price. 
So we can say, um, um, yeah, we want to have a specified um, amount of points from the current price. So we can say as, uh, TSA points um, shall be uh, 10,000 like this. And we can now use this input variable here to define the stop loss. So what we can do here is we can to, uh, we can take for any buy position, we can check if a uh, symbol info double underscore symbol underscore uh, comma symbol bit minus TSL points multiplied with point. So this would be a calculation for a simple stop loss level. So what we do here is we declare a double variable, which is just like any other variable, some space inside of your memory to hold a value. And a double value is a value that has a decimal point. For example, this would be a double value, this would be a double value, this would be a double value. Yeah, this works fine. So every number pretty much with a decimal point is a double value. So uh, now we have this um, SL variable and we initialize it with the uh, result of this calculation. What we do here is, first of all, we use the symbol info double function, which is pretty similar to the uh, position get string or position get integer function. But this works for the for a for a symbol. So we write the name of the function symbol info double, and then in parentheses we have to provide at least two parameters. The first one is the symbol that we want to receive the information for. In this case, we again can use the underscore symbol. Um, variable here to provide the name of the current chart symbol. And as a second parameter, we have to provide one of the um, um, allowed identifiers here. And you can read about these identifiers in the reference if you click on this enum symbol info double link here. So you will see all the identifiers that are valid identifiers for the symbol info double function. And we chose symbol bit here because it will return the bit price, so the current price for the chart symbol. Then we take this price, we subtract the TSL points that we defined up here um, from this um, bit value and we multiply the TSL points with a point value because TSL points is 10,000. And if we would subtract 10,000 from uh, the current bit price, which is uh, um, uh, 42,000, the SL would be placed at... Um, uh, 30, yeah, 32,000, which is um, a pretty large distance. So um, we do not want to do this, but instead we want to multiply this 10,000 with a value of point for the current chart. And the value of point is always the smallest price change um, of the current chart symbols. For example, in Bitcoin, it would be 0 0.01. And if we multiply 10,000 with 0 0.01, it would be 100. Um, points pretty much uh, or 100 euros or dollars um, for this current um, uh, chart symbol which is Bitcoin US dollar. So now we have a new SL and what we want to do now is we want to check if this new SL is greater than um, the current position SL. So what we want to do here is um, we want to or we can do it up here. We want to calculate the position SL. We can do this Maybe you already um, expected, but we can use the position get double uh, function for this. And we can say position as Alice or identifier here, because this will return the position stop loss. And if we are here already, I can copy this line uh, once, I think, for the position TP price, because we will need it later on. So we can just say position TP shall be stored inside of this post TP variable. And now we can check if this SL that we just created here is greater than the previous or the position SL. And if this is true, then we want to modify our position here. So we can um, modify the position by using the Ctrade class. So at the very top of your program, you can write this hashtag symbol here. You can write include and then in these brackets, uh, you want to write trade slash trade dot mqh because this will include a file to a program. And this allows us to now create objects of the ctrade class. This is kind of 
complex stuff if you are new to programming. This is um, object-oriented programming, which I will not explain in detail in this short tutorial. But you can check, um, check the link below this video if you want to have a full course in MQL5 programming. There you will learn everything about object-oriented programming and, and about the C-Trade class. But for now, we just have to know that we can use this trade object here um, to have access to the position modify function. And this function, it um, has three parameters. First of all, the position ticket, which we already have stored inside of our position ticket variable. Then the position SL, and this will be the new SL that we want to use now. And the position TP, and this will be the old TP because we do not want to change the TP. And we can now also uh, provide a print statement here like position number, position ticket was modified, like this. Make sure that you copy everything as I write it here. Oh, and I forgot to make the code a little bit bigger so you can read it properly on the PC. So make sure to copy everything like I do here. So do not forget any comma or any semicolon or any bracket because otherwise your program will not compile. Okay, and what I can now do is I can take this whole code here and I can copy it pretty much for the... Um, for the cell positions. So the calculation is a little bit different because in this case, of course, we want to have the ask price and add the TSL points to it because the uh, SL for a cell position is always above the current price. Then we check if the new SL is below the position SL. And we also have to check one more thing, but I will do this later on. And the rest is pretty much the same. If we click on compile now, you can see um, the positions are already modified and you can see the buy position already has a stop loss which is um, or which should be 100 whoops let me change the time frame 100 um, yeah or, or 10,000 points below the the highest price here and this is um, yeah I think this this should work I mean you can check it on your PC it should work and um, the cell position is not modified. And this is because um, the, the if condition is not true. So here we check if SL, if the newly calculated SL is smaller than the position SL. And this is false because right now the cell position doesn't have a SL. So the value for this is zero. So right now we are checking if this calculated SL price is smaller than zero, which is of course not true. So for every sell position, you should also always check if the position SL is equal to zero. Because in this case, the sell positions can be modified and you can see there is a SL for, sell, for the sell position. And yeah, as the market moves, um, the SL is also dragged always 100 points um, after the current bid or ask price. And this can be used in any market. So you can not only use this in Bitcoin, US dollar, you can use this in Euro, US dollar, in uh, DE40, US30, whatever you want to trade. So this is, uh, can be used in any, any chart pretty much. So this is how you can trade in a, a specific distance. I want to add some more stuff to this. For example, you can have a TSL trigger, maybe also in points. Because it might be the case that you want to say, I want to trail in a distance of 10,000 uh, MetaTrader points, but only after the price is 5,000 points above my uh, position open price. So what we can do here is we can say, um, before we do this whole calculation stuff, we want to check if the price is um, above the uh, position open price. So. First of all, we, hand, um, we want the position open price here. So we use the position get double function again, position price open, what, like this. And then we can, uh, buh, buh, buh. yeah, I, I would also recommend to store the bid and ask price in a variable here, like this, symbol, Info double symbol symbol bit and double ask symbol info double symbol symbol ask like this. And now we can exchange these uh, function calls with a bit and for the same position with the ask variable. And now we can check before we uh, do all the things here, 
we can check for the buy position if the bid price is greater than the position open price plus TSL trigger points multiplied with points. And only if this is true, so if the trigger is reached, we want to do the rest of the calculation and modification of the um, SL. And the same for the sell position. We check if the ask price is below the position open price minus TSL trigger points multiplied with point. And only if this is true, then we want to do um, the rest. Make sure to always like move your code um, to the right a little bit if you put it inside of an if statement because it makes it a lot more easier to read. So like this, this will now also uh, only modify the position if it is 5,000 points in profit already. So as you can see here, even if the price changes, the SA will not be modified because the TSA trigger is not reached. And yeah, we can see this if there is a new tick. I don't know, we have to wait for a new tick now. Okay, there we saw a new tick and the SL is not modified. But if we change, and you can always double click the trading stop system in the upper, uh, upper right corner to see the, um, uh, the settings. If we change the TSL trigger points to zero, then it should modify the um, buy position because we are currently above the um, buy entry price. So, so this is how you can use a, um, a trading stop trigger. And there is one more, one last thing that I want to demonstrate here because I want to show you how you can use a, um, wait, let me change this again. I want to show you how you can use any indicator to, to use it as a trading stop. So what we can do here is, for example, we can use a, a moving average indicator to use it as a trading stop. So a moving average indicator always has to be created or can be, uh, the values of a moving average can be received using a handle. You typically um, declare this handle inside of a on init function. If you do not know the process of declaring a moving average or indicator handles and everything, make sure to check out the other tutorials on this channel. I explained this multiple times. And if you, again, if you want to have everything in a structured way and a complete course, check out the link below this video. But we can create now, uh, we can now create a handle in the uh, on init function using the IMA function. There we have to provide a symbol, a um, time frame. And I would always suggest to, um, TSL MA time frame to make this a um, input variable so the user will be able to change this. And of course, we also need periods for this moving average, for example, 20 periods. And we need, whoops, this has to be of type integer. And we need the enum um, MA method um, input here. MA or TSL MA method mode SMA. And we need the applied price. This is also a um, input variable that I always declare here. So the user is able to change this really quick. And then we can choose the TSL MA time frame, TSL MA period, um, shift value. I hear most of the time choose the zero, the method, and the TSL. MA applied price. So again, if you do not understand anything here, check out the other video tutorials first and then come back to this video. And um, yeah, this is a way of declaring any indicator handle. You can do the same for the I bands, for the Bollinger Bands indicator, for the Fractals indicator, for the uh, Stochastic indicator. So you can pretty much choose most of the basic indicators using the I and then indicator name a function to create a indicator handle. And then we can go back to our on tick function. And here we can now choose, um, or we can now use this um, uh, handle here to receive the current moving average price. So what we can do here is we can say, uh, we use the copy buffer function, and then we provide our handle MA we have the buffer number zero, or we can also choose mainline as a identifier for this. We have starting position one, count one, and we store the values inside of our MA array here. If we compile this, yeah, we can now see that everything works and we now have a value stored inside of our MA array. So for a um, buy position, we can now um, check if uh, or we can calculate the SL here, which is um, 
No, we do not have to do this. We just have to check if the um, if the MA value, or we first of all check if the array size of this MA array is greater than zero. And then we check if the MA value at index zero is greater than the position SL. And in this case, then we want to uh, modify the trade. Well, oh, what I saw here is we can, of course, declare this C trade object variable up here so we do not have to do it here multiple times. So we can now choose uh, or copy this code pretty much because this is always the same. So we put it here. Uh, and we can say by MATSL, we can. Um, yeah, modify these print statements uh, some some more so we see what kind of trading stop um, modified the positions. So, um, yeah, let, let me do let me do it like this. If S, um, double S L is equal to M A, if S L is equal to yeah, just um, let's just do it like this. It makes it a little bit clearer because now we know that the MA value is stored inside of this SL variable, which we then use to modify our position. Then we can, can copy this whole block here and put it at the right place for the cell positions um, like this. And in this case, of course, we have to check if the new SL is below the position SL or if the position SL is equal to zero. And then we want to modify the S, uh, SL. And there's one more thing because this may cause problems because, um, yeah, you can see here it tries to modify a position, but it doesn't work. And this is, um, I think this is because uh, it tries to modify the buy position, but um, the current um, moving average indicator, and I can just demonstrate this by uh, showing the moving average indicator in the chart. You can see the 20 period simple moving average is currently above the um, uh, above the, the 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 current price. So we cannot put the SL for a buy position above the current market price. So what we have to check here is before we uh, modify the buy position, we want to check if this SL is below the current bid price. And for the sell position, of course, we have to check if the new SL is above the current ask price. Only if we do it like this, the error messages will no longer appear here in the, um, in the journal. Yeah. So as you can see, there are new ticks, but there is no error message. And of course, we can open a sell position again. And you can see the SL is always placed on the last moving average value, so for the last, last bar. You can, of course, also choose the current moving average value. You just have to change the, um, the copy buffer function here, and then you have to say starting position is zero instead of one, and this would change the SL to the current uh, moving average price. And yeah, you can see it will be then... Um, yeah, stopped out if this price is reached. And if you are wondering why the execution is above the current price, this is because um, sale positions are, of course, always closed at the current ask price. So you can show the ask price here. If you right-click the chart and click on um, uh, properties, and then you can see the current ask price is this red line. It is a lot higher than the current bid price, and it always changes. So sale positions are closed above the current bid price, of course. So let me explain this program one more time. So at the very top of our program, we first of all include the trade.mqh file. So we have access to the C trade class that we later need to modify our positions. Then we have several input variables here. And input variables are the type of variables that the user can find in the inputs. Uh, inputs tab here if it uh, if he opens the uh, expert advisor settings. We have uh, input variables for the distance of our normal TSL in points and we have variables so we can define the moving average indicator that we want to use for our uh, trading stop. 
Then we have another global variable and make sure that you realize that this is not an input variable because the input modifier is missing before the int, um, or before the type declaration here. This is named handle ma. We use this handle ma variable to create a indicator handle, in this case a moving average indicator handle in the onInit function. For the indicator handle uh, function, which is ima, we have several um, parameters. You can read about them, of course, in the documentation if you search for the ima entry here. And you can see all the uh, parameters here listed and explained. And this will then create a handle for a um, moving average indicator and the handle is pretty much just a description which is stored somewhere in the background of the MetaTrader and which the MetaTrader program can then use to, um, yeah, to, to look up what exact moving average indicator you want to calculate. Then we go to the onInit function because this is the function that you, we want to place most of our code inside. And there is only one for loop inside of this on tick function. And this is one big for loop because we use this for loop to loop over all the open positions. And we can do this using this formula. I explained this very detailed before, so I will not do it again. Um, after selecting a position and checking if this position has the same position symbol as the chart symbol, we then create several variables here. First of all, the object variable named trade of type C trade because we will use it later on to use the position modify function to modify the open positions and to um, yeah, update the SL. Then we receive um, some properties of the currently selected position. We can use the position get double function for this. Make sure every time you use this position get double function, you have to select a position before, otherwise this might not work. Okay, yeah, so we store the position open price, the position SL, and the position TP in three separate variables of type double. Then we have two more double variables, which is the bid and ask variable. We store the current bid and the current ask price inside of it. We receive these prices using the symbol info double function, providing the current chart symbol and the symbol bid or symbol ask identifier. Then we calculate the moving average. And we do this using the copy buffer function. This is a function that you can use to receive values from any indicator handle pretty much because this is the first in or parameter for this copy buffer function. Then you have to provide what line or what indicator buffer you want to extract the values from. In this case, the moving average only has one line. So it is always main underscore line or zero. I mean, you can choose it is both the same. Then we have to provide the starting index. In this case, we chose zero, which is the current bar. So the last bar at the very right side. If we choose one, we would start at the previous bar and two at this bar and three at this bar and so on and so on. And then we have to provide the amount of values that we want to store inside of our moving average array. An array is always um, uh, declared using these uh, squared brackets and it can hold multiple values of the same type. In this, case, in this case, we only want to store one value inside of this moving average array. After pro um, preparing all these values and all this data, we then check if we currently selected a buy position. If this is true, we want to check if the bid price is greater than the position open price plus our TSA trigger for the normal TSA. If this is true, we calculate the SL price. And what is always a good idea is to normalize this price. We can do this by writing SL is equal to normalize double SL and then um, comma underscore digits because this will round it to the precision of the current um, chart symbols digits. So um, this, yeah, just make sure that you do not have problems with rounding issues or something like this. So this is always a good habit to round prices. Then we check if this uh, currently calculated SL is greater than the position SL. If this is true, we use the position modify function, which is part of the C trade class, which we can access using the, the C trade object um, or this trade object variable, and we modify the position. If this was successful, we have a print statement um, that shows a text in the experts journal, so we can see what the program does. 
Okay, so this is everything for the normal TSA. Then we also have the moving average TSA. And again, I can place this code here. So we round this SL value. It's always a good habit, as I said before. So what we do here is we check if the array size of the moving average array is greater than zero. So this is just to make sure that the copy buffer function was executed successfully and that a value was stored inside of this array. Then we choose the first, well, the zeroth <laughs> index of this moving average array to receive the current moving average price and we store it inside of this SL variable. We then round this value and then we do the same as we did before. We check if the price is currently, or if the new SL is um, greater than the position SL. And for this specific case, because the moving average price can be above the current bid price, we check if this SL, which is the moving average price, is below the bid price and everything else is the same. We modify the position and we have a print statement to say what exactly we did here. And of course, we do the exact same thing for this part here where we check if we selected a cell position. Yeah, the calculations are a little bit different, but the process is completely the same. And this is what you can do for every trailing stop. So as you see here, I demonstrated two trailing stops using a normal calculation in points and one using a indicator. And for any other trailing stop that you want to implement, you can always use this program as a base program because the raw skeleton can always stay the same. The one thing that changes is the calculation. But this in the end comes down to mathematical algorithms and calculations and I can not tell you every trading stop because there are 1000 different um, ways of trailing your stops and I on, only want to give you an example and you can now modify this um, however you want to modify it so you can add uh, one or two trading stops you can modify these trading stops you can exchange the indicator you can add more indicators so this is why I always say it is important to learn the basics and once you you have the basics figured out, you can go on from there. And it will be so much easier for you to, to adapt um, new uh, styles of moving your SL, for example, if you already know the basic concept. So um, I hope that you were able to understand some, some mechanisms that I wanted to explain in this tutorial. And if you did, I would be Super happy if you could like this video and make sure to write a comment just for the YouTube algorithm. It would really help me. It would help YouTube to suggest this people, uh, this 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 uh, tutorial to more people, so more people can benefit from uh, benefit from it. Okay, this is it. I hope you liked the tutorial. Let me leave a comment what you want to see on YouTube. Make sure to check out the complete course below this video if you want to learn this in much more detail and with a better structure. So, yeah, see you next time. Until then, have a good time. Great trades. Bye-bye.